Hello, my name is Elizabeth Goldstein and I'm the president of MAS and I'm delighted to have you all join us this afternoon for this first of our series, um, a first session in a series of conversations on the future of open space. From pan pandemic to protest, the events of 2020 have underscored the role of the public realm in urban life. Composed of parks, plazas, playgrounds, streets, sidewalks, bike lanes and more, we've seen these precious spaces pushed to capacity by the pressures of social distancing throughout. In response, cities all over the world have been experimenting with ways to build a more livable public realm through design and policy solutions. With so much uncertainty still ahead, what are the long-term implications of these learnings and experiments? And how have the structural inequities predating COVID been exacerbated by this crisis? Can we look to open space to offer some solutions? In our 2019 report, Bright Ideas, MAS and our partners, New Yorkers for Parks, came together to call for the creation of a director of the public realm, a new position tasked with coordinating the constellation of public and private entities that oversee our public space. Today, we will hear a discussion about some of our local experiments, as well as examples from Baltimore and Los Angeles to help us seek even better solutions during this ch challenging time. Before we uh, get started, here are some things to note. Using the chat function, you can comment and interact with each other. There is also a Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. There you can share any questions and our panelists will take time towards the end of, uh, end of the session to answer them. And we have also added some tips in the chat for your reference. If you need assistance, you can chat MAS staff directly and they, will, they are marked with MAS under the participant list. Our program today is anticipated to run uh, for about an hour and is being recorded. A recording will be available later on our YouTube channel and Facebook page where you can also view uh, most of our post pre uh, past programming. As a reminder, tonight's program offers free CM credits uh, to AICP members. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce our moderator for this evening, Susan Chin. Susan is an architect, an accomplished one at that, an urbanist and civic leader, and has formed an independent consultancy, Design Connects. She serves on the New York uh, City and Co. Board and the East Midtown Governing Group. She recently led the Design Trust for Public Space that unlocks the potential of New York City's public spaces, has been unlocking the, the potential of New York City's public spaces since 1995. Prior to the Design Trust, she was the Assistant Commissioner at, for Capital Projects at the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, supporting architecture and public art citywide. She also served on the um, American Institute of Architects Board and as the AIA New York chapter president. I'm delighted to turn things over to Susan, who will be introducing our panelists this evening alongside their presentations. Let's get started. Thanks, Elizabeth. I'm delighted to be here. And thanks to the Municipal Art Society for this series on the future of open space, adaptation, access, and equity. In the next few weeks, we'll discuss small business, bikes and transport, and parks, and I hope you'll tune in then. We've all experienced the new normal of life out of balance in the past six months. Open space is our touchstone, the essential and the adaptable infrastructure to restore health and wellness and our economy. The public's become the personal. We've also found government, the top down, can't do it all and community engagement uh, and bottom-up planning and equity are ever more important now. Typically, we view parks as our open space, but not every neighborhood has a park nearby. However, all neighborhoods have streets. 
valued for their traffic flow and mobility. So now how do we pivot to open space for people? Walking, cycling, relaxing, food trucks and carts, outdoor classes, performances, expanding retail, creating parklets, and much more. Mayor de Blasio recently announced that open streets restaurants will become a year-long permanent program. Get out your woolly blanket. So as we plan for the city's long-term recovery, how do we ensure our open spaces become more equitable, especially for those who lack access? How do we develop better models for shared space, including partnerships, stewardship, governance, and civic participation? So now to begin, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Gould, Executive Director for the Neighborhood Design Center in Baltimore since 2012. Jennifer directs all aspects of the center's operations and strategy. Her passion, don't we all need passion? For grassroots mm -hmm. community development, focuses on transportation planning, public space design, equity in, equi and equity in access to public space in Baltimore. Earlier this year, in partnership with the City of Baltimore and Baltimore's Economic Development Corporation, NDC released design guidelines for distancing, fostering interventions for safely reopening to support small business. Jennifer, we look forward to hearing about this project and your work. Thanks. Thanks so much, Susan and Emmaus, for welcoming me and a bit of Baltimore to the stage tonight. Um, I'm going to share screen and share a little bit of a presentation, a short one about design for distancing and the equity issues I've uh, seen coming to the fore through COVID-19 in the public realm um, uh, as a little bit of food for thought. Thank you again. So as mentioned, NDC is Maryland's Community Design Center. We're headquartered in Baltimore and then also have a second office in Prince George's uh, County, which is uh, a DC suburb, um, but we work statewide. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization and we provide pro bono and uh, contractual design assistance to community uh, initiated projects. Um, we've been doing this work since 1968 with over 3000 projects in our 50, now two year history. Um, tonight, though, I'm here to talk about Design for Distancing. Um, this is a program of the Baltimore Development Corporation with the support of the Mayor of Baltimore. It's an initiative uh, de created to um, invest uh, some uh, grant funds in our uh, local retail business districts to support um, the uh, 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 investment in our small business community, which is uh, treasured in Baltimore, but is also the place where many Baltimoreans meet their daily needs, um, since uh, much of Baltimore doesn't have access to a personal vehicle. Um, so the, this program was a three-part program. Uh, we worked with uh, experts from the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health, as well as local business leaders, local business district leaders, agencies to put together a design brief of the challenge to be met for small business. Um, and from that design brief uh, opened a, an open competition um, that resulted in a pattern book. Uh, that pattern book is an open source resource uh, available to anyone working in a small business district or small business owners to come up with uh, solutions uh, to uh, in, increase access to their business uh, for local residents during COVID-19, but will hopefully be a resource for using our public space for um, retail, commercial, uh, for a long time to come. And then finally, uh, the mayor of Baltimore and BDC invested about a million and a half dollars in 18 projects all across the city, where we are working with the local uh, small businesses and the local uh, small business districts to come up with a custom design for each one of their districts to um, support uh, uh, expansion of services in the public realm over until, until next summer, in essence, um, with hopefully some of those things moving to a more permanent status then. Um, as we've all seen um, in the initial stages of COVID-19, obviously we all still need to meet our basic needs day in and day out. 
Uh, small businesses are inherently nimble and creative in solutions. And so we all saw the things like cones, uh, tape stripes, open windows, uh, so that we could all uh, feed ourselves, get our hair cut once those things open, do our laundry, um, and, uh, and also just have those basic human interactions that we all uh, love as city dwellers and uh, you know, want to make sure that we're keeping our mental health as strong as our physical health. Um, and so you know, we, we uh, in, in, in cooperation with BDC, really felt that um, bringing as many great ideas to the table as we could and making those ideas available as broadly as we could was a, a great kickoff to the project. Um, and so uh, we put together this ideas guidebook that includes uh, 10 designs, but also on the design for distancing Instagram, you can see all the entries. There were about 180 entries, um, if I'm remembering correctly, and all of those were posted on the Instagram. So you can get lots and lots of food for thought there as well. And now, uh, just a couple months later, with the cooperation of city agencies and the local business districts, we're starting to see all these interventions come to life. Uh, we all know how creative design, the design and build community is in our cities, um, and uh, to see them all come straight to the uh, challenge and apply themselves so creatively and so productively. Um, it's really, really exciting to see these not only uh, start to pop up in our neighborhoods, but start to actually um, meet the needs of the community and be used in the way that we might hope. You know, that the uh, amazing solutions really provide for that safe flow of pedestrians versus restaurant users, as well as restaurant staff, and allow the people that are, um, uh, uh, you know, dining or uh, seeing a distance performance to really use the space uh, in a way that is uh, safe as far as we know to today's standards coming out of the School for Public, school for public Health. Um, and uh, as, as I think we're all uh, seeing that COVID-19 is occurring at a time when we are um, coming to, to grapple uh, even more deeply with the structural issues uh, of uh, racism that are endemic in America. And um, these issues really cause us, prompt us once again to wholeheartedly reconsider our relationship to the built environment and the way that systems uh, make the, that built environment uh, work for certain portions of our um, communities and disadvantage others systematically and by design. And as designers, we have the ability and the responsibility to um, look to those systems as well as the momentary issues. Um, you know, I know in Baltimore, uh, uh, we're still a, a largely segregated city, and there can often be a 20 year difference in life, uh, lifespan in Baltimore by zip code. And that is because uh, people were segregated to places that were not safe to live in the city from an environmental perspective, and those systems are still in place. And so people are now full time stuck in those environments and not just, you know, children aren't able to leave for half the day to school, et cetera. Furthermore, our transportation systems are, are now not serving the full population uh, with limited bus ridership, limited ability to access jobs, and people are fully dependent on the retail that's available in their neighborhood and uh, need to be able to walk there safely. And we all know that um, that isn't actually safe for everyone in the world right now. Furthermore, those local business networks, um, we, we, not all of us can uh, 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 put our credit card in our computers and have Amazon bring groceries to our door. Uh, many of us are dependent on uh, the, the business network in our neighborhood and are having to come up with uh, creative solutions just to get access to meet your basic food needs. Many, many of the children in Baltimore get most of their food needs met at school. Um, and so the, um, the challenges placed on our local business networks in order to feed and uh, allow for personal care are very, very high right now. And furthermore, um, many, many, many Baltimoreans are on the other side of the, 
uh, uh, digital divide with no access to Wi-Fi in their home. Um, as we know, all children are now learning in their home. Many people have been asked to work from home. And until we provide um, digital access as, a, as a, a, a right and a public service rather than a uh, recognize that it is not a consumer good, that it's a public good, um, uh, we're going to continue to exacerbate equity issues. Um, so I'm uh, so thankful to be able to share the stage tonight and really can't wait for the discussion we get to have. Thanks again. Thanks, Jennifer. For our audience, please post your questions at the bottom of your screen at the Q in the Q&A box or button. Um, we'll discuss more soon, but first I'd like to introduce uh, Wajenda Chabeski. Uh, to tell us about Los Angeles's public realm. Wajenda recently joined LA's Advance Planning Division as a transportation planner. He's former program director for Mayor Eric Garcetti's Great Streets Program, or yeah, a community-centered urban design and public infrastructure initiative. Prior to this, he served in various capacities as a policy analyst, in an Los Angeles nonprofit organizations, working on mobility, affordable, affordable housing, and economic and racial justice advocacy. And now, over to you, Agenda. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's an honor to share this stage with uh, all the brilliant uh, minds and the people that are doing all this great work in our public space. So I'm here to talk about the program that I ran in the mayor's office, uh, the Great Streets Initiative. And I just, I would like to talk about it in context from how the city started doing, uh, has always traditionally uh, implemented project to where we are going uh, as a city and how we uh, view uh, project implementation and you know service delivery in general uh, for the city of Los Angeles and uh, in the end I'll tie it into how what we've built um, throughout these years has come in handy especially during these uh, COVID times. So about the Great Streets Initiative this was the very first mayoral uh, executive directive um, in 2013 when the mayor came into office and this came at the back uh, after the mayor, the mayor and the team realized that one of the biggest assets that the city has, the city of Los Angeles, is its streets, which accounts to approximately 18% of the total public space that we own. And the, the idea that came in uh, with that was to think about how can we reuse this abundance space? How can we repurpose it? How can we think about how we can uh, live, work, and learn, and recreate on a daily basis uh, through this um, uh, through this uh, asset that we own as a city. Uh, initially, when the program started, it was a it was very much a bottom up approach, which um, the mayor and the council offices uh, identified one major corridor in the 15 districts that uh, Los Angeles has, and that was designated a Great Street, and we. The, the goal uh, ultimately for that was just to ensure that those uh, 15 streets that were selected uh, increased the economic activity. We wanted to revamp small businesses in most of these corridors. We wanted to, because Los Angeles is such a diverse city and with every block that you turn to, the city looks different, the, the, the area looks different from the previous. We wanted to make sure that each and every one of those uh, neighborhoods bring out their character. So we have Filipino town, we have Thai town, we have Little Ethiopia, we have all these different um, ethnic enclave, enclaves for that exist in Los Angeles. And we wanted to make sure that as we uh, uh, improve these streets, we wanted to bring out that char uh, character. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that we have the, these corridors and, and the city in general is environmentally resilient just in the, to consider all the, and this is back in 2013, even before we had the uh, Los Angeles plan, uh, sustainability plan, the idea was to make sure that all these communities are sustainable and resilient in the long term. Um, 
as you might know, um, the streets are one of the, uh, in Los Angeles with so much traffic, uh, the streets are generally unsafe. And we wanted to make sure that as we implement these projects, we'll make sure that the, the streets are safe and secure. And we wanted to make sure that we engage the community, though the initial engagement was a top-down approach, but there was that goal to make sure that um, the communities are engaged in every, proce in every process of project delivery. Access and mobility as well, we just wanted to make sure that we're planning for, we're planning streets and developing not just for cars, but just for everybody that needed access to these uh, streets. So after the 15 were selected and we did our first uh, projects and we engaged our communities, we realized that one of the biggest challenges that we have, there's a discrepancy between the needs of the city as in general, uh, from a professional and a bureaucratic standpoint. And, the, and there's a difference between what the community actually needs. So we just started seeing all these um, difference in needs and kind of led to some, some kind of frustration whenever we went to a community, presented a plan and they were like, you, they would always come back to us, well, I don't think this is our priority as a community, you know. So we started, you know, taking those lessons and started thinking about, okay, how can we change our approach uh, in how we deliver our projects in the in the uh, in the communities. So we started thinking about creating what we ended up calling the uh, Great Streets Challenge Grant, which was a very collaborative effort um, where we went to the communities, created a grant and asked the communities their needs and what they wanted and provided them with funding and technical assistance for them to, to initiate a planning process so that they can create um, the streets that they imagine to, to best fit the needs of the community. Um, and our challenge grant, um, many wanted to ensure that we build strong, stronger partnerships with the community, uh, between the community and the city wanted to make sure that we empower communities to develop a vision that transforms their community. So everything that we wanted to see in the community, we wanted to make sure that this is something that was uh, envisioned by the community. Also just we working with a um, technical consultant, usually an outside consultant, we, we helped them, you know, we wanted to make sure that they are able to design infrastructure that uh, not only just meets their needs, but also something that is very feasible and implementable. So we wanted to make sure that we work with a technical consultant on this one. Um, and the, one of the biggest things, and I'll touch on this at the end, is that uh, I don't know what the experience are of, in other cities, but many communities, especially low-income communities, tend to be engaged on a very aggressive scale, but they don't get to see the final infrastructure. One of the things that, um, one of the funniest things that I saw in my experience was one of the projects that we had for Great Streets was on Fifth, Fourth Streets in Boyle Heights. We had a table and we had a pop-up event to reimagine how that corridor was gonna look like. But when I met one of the um, longest serving uh, employees at the Department of uh, Transportation, they showed me an exact, a picture at the exact location from the 70s where the community had been engaged to improve the street. But fast forward in 2017, 18, the streets still look the same. So wanted to make sure that every project that we uh, initiate finds a path to implementation. And in, in our uh, process, in as much as we wanted to make this uh, a community-based initiative, we we did our part as a city and took a data analysis approach in ensuring that we implement the projects. So we wanted to make sure that we identify communities that express the highest needs. Uh, if you see the maps that I'm showing right now is that there's a big, there's a very close, close relationship between communities that are economically disadvantaged, the one that have the highest injury networks. So if you see it's what we call the HIN within a one mile buffer, and there's also like a relationship between those two communities and where the jobs are located, as well as the public health outcomes. So what we did um, as a city is that in order for us to push out this project that we wanted to make sure that we address needs, we wanted to do our due diligence on our end to collect data and use that information to target those communities during the application process so that we make sure that we engage those communities and give them an, an opportunity to um, to 
create uh, corridors that um, address their needs. So the, pro uh, the process that we created uh, was pretty much straightforward, but it, uh, it's, it took much longer than, than what we had planned. Um, we had an application uh, period that was open for two months for the challenge grant. Then we selected 10 projects for this previous round, which just ended in March of, uh, in, in, in February of uh, 2020. Uh, 10 projects were selected, and from those 10 um, projects, they conducted over a six month period of community outreach and creating their vision. Like I said in the beginning, we gave them enough time to reach the community, to engage them in various ways. And then from that, 10 projects, we selected four projects that we advanced that we deemed to be most ready to receive implementation plans. And six of them are currently working on two ways that they will um, find uh, funding for, for their projects. So, and then now we are in the process of finalizing design and then construction will begin sometime next year. So, one of the biggest, greatest achievements that we've had to this point is that we have 28 corridors that we um, call great streets and are designated as great streets. And we have uh, engaged over 80,000 uh, residents within the city of Los Angeles. And the engagement has been very deep and meaningful. And we have, we have made improvements since 2013 to now of over 70 miles of street um, street miles and from from this program some of the things that we realize is that in as much as this was a transportation infrastructure projects we realized that in order for us to be successful and to achieve some of our goals that i highlighted earlier like economic um, activity we decided to create a, a project a, another initiative that goes together with great streets called the great streets great business and this uh, Great Streets, Great Business uh, is strictly focused on creating businesses on those corridors and helping uh, small businesses in loan application, in, um, in facade improvements, and just ensuring that they are a thriving business and that can stay in those corridors. And we've had a diverse uh, group of projects that have come in. We've in installed bike lanes, curb extensions, parklets. We've installed business signage, like I said, for Great Streets, Great Business. And we've established really strong uh, community partnership. Uh, we've built, um, the communities have been so much empowered in a way that they have been used, they've, they've come to work with the city on various projects. So in this post COVID world, one of the biggest thing that happened is the city initiated a project called Slow Streets and uh, two, two projects, LA, uh, Slow Streets and uh, LA Alfresco. These two programs were initiated uh, through the partners that we've created with the Great Streets Initiative. We reached out to those partners that we've had, but because they have had a great working relationship, we were able to roll out Slow Streets and LA Alfresco very smoothly to, um, you know, to, to, be, to create uh, open spaces uh, for communities that don't have access to parks uh, within their neighborhoods as well as creating a space for small businesses to be able to continue uh, through these um, uh, COVID times. And Great agenda, let's continue the conversation a little later. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. And now let's turn, return to New York. It's my pleasure to introduce Janet Liff. Uh, Janet is com a committed New Yorker and has spent her career at the nexus of transportation and real estate. A leading member of the Open Space, Open Streets Coalition at Transportation Alternatives. She's also a director of Street Space, a political action committee that endorses New York City and New York State candidates with progressive transportation agendas. She recently launched the Neighborhood Empowerment Project at Open Plans, an initiative that addresses the lack of public, local public space management. Janet. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Nice to, to join this community here. Um, I'll show, bring up what I'm going to show in a minute, uh, but it's been very interesting because versus Baltimore or Los Angeles, in response to COVID, uh, New York City launched a really radical program. Uh, for those of you who are not from New York City, um, that they uh, completely non-bureaucratic 
any neighborhood, any street want to apply for an open street 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. as long as they were a local community group or even a single residence on behalf of a community group, they could get an open street. So it was a radical approach, you know, addressing COVID times. Some, in some places we have had success um, where there are stewards for the streets, the streets have some length and there's some, uh, these stewards create some activity. So I, I didn't bring the images of it, but I encourage you, all of you to look at 34th Street and Jackson Heights, Avenue B and Berry Street, all of which are at least a mile or so long. And um, as I say, have these very committed community members who do everything they have to do to maintain the streets. So that's probably about, um, six miles of our streets and the rest of our of the 67 of 100 miles i'd say half of those generously somebody applied the street was open it was short not connected communities were not um you know ongoing engagement and active so a lot of this this space has sat fallow and i know uh, susan actually lives on one of those streets that may have moments of fun but is is uh I'm also working on that project on 103rd Street, but you know, all it is is police barriers and people are not invited into the space. So to address that problem, what I'm gonna to share today is uh, I am engaged with the Future Street Committee of the AIA. And um, we identified the Meatpacking District as being um, a good candidate for um, a good partner because the district had two shared open streets that were not working. One was a commercial street, one was a street that ran between uh, a, a 17th street which was between public housing. So we thought these are two great types, let's go out there and model sort of the potential and hopefully uh, demonstrate some ways and in, in inexpensive materials that people could then use and then apply to their own open streets. Uh, I'll show you the video, uh, you know, we did, the good and the bad of it is we did start with a baseline of keeping our budget tight, but then because this was with a business improvement district, there lots was donated and there was, you know, the largesse of a certain amount of, um, uh, of also skilled labor. So the result is a, great model, but then when we can discuss later about equity, whether or not it can be applied as broadly as we would like, you know, is another story, but at least it's um, an inspiration. More pedestrian prioritized spaces. On this side are more trees and vegetation, so we're Oops, bringing the highlights. I'm sorry, I'm uh, on our not starting on our at bringing. the front here. Yeah. District as a future street. The Neighborhood Association, the Business Group District, worked with AIA, ASLA to come up with this amazing design that really lends itself to the nature of the district. Public space, we've got lawns behind us, lounge area here. It incorporates the uses of the restaurants, um, enhances the retail footprint on the street. Good public space is good for business. And if folks feel comfortable spending time in a space, it's really likely they're going to end up shopping. And what we're doing today is to show the city and the community how amazing it is to provide more pedestrian prioritized spaces. On this side are more trees and vegetation as so we're bringing the highlight in. People lounging on our reclaimed timbers. As you move forward, there's a center space. So there's a musician throughout the day and a live muralist painting art on the wall. Toward the end is all of our food and beverage. Uh, as you notice on the other side of this property, our public spaces with big red umbrellas. Here we got 5,000 square feet donated sod. We painted the street and connected the sidewalk to the street to show that this was one contiguous space. As soon as we laid the first piece of sod, as soon as we started chalking um, the cobblestones of the sidewalk, you felt the warmth of the block, the character of the block change. It brought a more pedestrian scale to the streetscape and Currently, um, found themselves wanting to wander down this block. And these are our barricades. We designed these on wheels so that the centerpiece is movable. We wanted to make sure the district is able to block cars when they need to, but also allow trucks and other cargo to come through. These particular barricades were left over from a nearby. 
my construction project. Uh, so the inspiration was your DOT rolled out their, their open streets program, and we discovered that a lot of them were not working. They were just kind of like dead, disactivated spaces, and nobody walked on them. And if you can believe it, there was no pedestrian traffic on the street before this installation went in. What's worth doing is looking at the street next door, which is absolutely the before shot of this street, which is also an open street, open for restaurants, and there is no activity on it. So that's a little inspiration. Uh, we were lucky in that uh, we have more of New York City now has an open streets for restaurant programs, which has just been made permanent. So that was, that actually was, we, we were, you know, we had the luxury of being able to do this installation and having it actually last for three days. Um, and unfortunately at the end of three days, we had to dispose of the sod and wash off the sidewalks, but we do hope that we inspired some people who um, hadn't actually experienced this before. And then we did, um, where we're just, we're putting together the results of the surveys now, but needless to say, the, you know, 70% of the people preferred shopping here, most preferred eating here. Um, the meatpacking district is taking a look at business receipts on the one Saturday versus the next Saturday. And, you know, we do intend to use this as, as, a, as a model that can hopefully, you know, inspire you know, other, other locations in the city. Thank you. So. Thanks, Janet. That was inspirational. I'm sad that it just popped up for, yes. for three days. Oh my goodness. But let's turn to our discussion um, and bring back Jennifer and Magenda. Um, I'll, I'll start with, oh, let's see. I was gonna start with a couple questions, but um, why don't we start with a question from Andy Menchel, um, who says, how and from where can, can should we secure funds to ensure maintenance and programming over time to make open streets, uh, to make sure open streets are sustainable? I'd say that's the million dollar question, you know, and that's the, the problem in New York and why most of these, the, you know, we, use, we were in the business, the business improvement districts and things happen there because they have the ability to tax. And, uh, when you know I was at Open Plans and we developed this program for the neighborhood empowerment, it's kind of the thing you keep butting up against because if the city doesn't want to invest the funds, you're you know we're stuck. It it, ha it has to become you know not for profit organizations that can raise money or get grants, but it's very hard to blanket the entire city. You know, one thing that we discovered, you know, working on this neighborhood empowerment project is, you know, the bids are great, but they are only 2% of New York City. So 98% of our city doesn't have a local place management function. So maybe we should bring some citizen action to, uh, to bear. Um, you know, I remember back to the 70s and the 80s in New York City, right after the fiscal crisis and or even after 9-11, um, how, you know, people would take action on their own. So kind of guerrilla, guerrilla gardens, guerrilla, um, you know, I, not, not to say that they're gonna pave potholes, but um, are there ways, I don't know, Agenda in LA, are there ways for citizens to just get involved, um, you know, wearing your kind of mm, public official hat how could, how could we bring citizen action um, to bear? Yeah, I'll, I'll, first of all, I just want to agree with, um, with Janet on this. It's, uh, maintenance funds are pretty much the highest uh, drawback for any kind of improvements. Uh, even how the terminology we use, anything that's not standard on the street is considered substandard and we, the city usually doesn't even have the equipment to clean those. So for example, even the protected bike lanes that have been installed throughout Los Angeles, we are, we are having a hard time maintaining that. But, um, but, and I agree, like for the projects that we had in business improvement districts, like in downtown Los Angeles or any area where the businesses are very strong, we tend to have like 
a strong commitment to maintain and you know maintain any kind of improvements that we had and and that's what the, the approach that we're moving towards now is when we talk about uh any future funding now we always want to build in maintenance because maintenance has far been neglected in in california we have various bond measures that uh, allow us to to build infrastructure but not necessarily to maintain it so for the most part we've relied on communities so if for example for great streets one of the things that we ask is that we we partner with a nonprofit organization that's registered and that way there's some some level of continuity when we install a project so we are very limited in terms of who we work with uh, because maintenance becomes an issue so if we work with a nonprofit organization they can go for city grants they can go for outside grants and be able to maintain that so and that's the one thing that we tend to stick on especially with the uh, challenge grant to ensure that we have the built-in um, uh, maintenance approach to the projects that we install Thanks. Um, Jennifer, do you have something to add? Um, no, other than, you know, we, we were very careful to build a contingency within the overall budget to maintain these projects over the coming months. Um, our business improvement districts might have the funds to, to maintain that, but many of our other districts do not have funds for that. And people are often working two or three jobs to keep their heads above water. So the people that can actually participate in this sort of DIY are actually often people that are of greater privilege. Um, and, and it continues to rebuild those spaces for people that already have the, the means to get access to them. Um, uh, but that um, certainly, uh, you know, as Agenda suggested, one of the greater challenges for the public realm is that, you know, obviously these are often like on the other side of a traffic barrier because these are also public right. roads. And so the DIY, you have enormous liability issues. The only thing that even made this possible was that um, basically BDC said, you know, this because it is the public realm, we're gonna put kind of a blanket responsibility in terms of liability on all these projects yeah. on BDC. You can't actually do DIY something in the street because then you are uh, putting humans at risk <laughs> too. <laughs> and so like, that's always the rub is like, you know, there are certain things that we could be doing like paint, but even that the, the DOT says, you know, that can be a distraction. You could be causing accidents. You have to rip that out. Um, so it's, it's really uh, the public space challenge, especially when we're taking on streets as public space and not just green space as public space, the bar really gets raised in terms of that DIY approach. Right. I guess that's, that's our challenge is how do we look at this, um, these solutions and pop-ups or pilots as being um, informing long-term long -term solutions, right? Um, I do think that the economic development side of it is a good side to push that, you know, right now we're really dependent on these as economic spaces and not just as culture spaces and that our economic development arms really should be taking a look at the way that people love to use these and how much business, more business it drives. Yep. Great. And I also think, you know, it is really cross cutting where your health, um, your social resilience, your physical resilience is so dependent on, on, on this open infrastructure now. Right. Yep. Yeah, and, and I just want to add uh, to what Jennifer said, you know, on top of the maintenance is the liability aspect that comes into play. So one of the things we use to ask our co community partners is that you need to provide liability insurance before you do any pop-up or before we partner you with, with you on any project. But we... Uh, and you haven't had any rebellion, Wajenda? We've had some rebellion from <laughs> our, some we of our uh, business improvement districts. We've, we've had it, we've had it, and especially in the previous round. In the current round, we've been able to work around that. And thankfully, the city is working on um, creating, uh, being able to take on liability for projects that are initiated within the city, even though they're designed by the community. So we are moving forward on that and we'll be able to cover the liability aspect, but we still have to work on the maintenance aspect on how that, because that's very much, you know, that's tied into funding, long-term funding. Right. Yeah, that's what's so radical about the program that is happening right now is that the DOT did not require insurance certificates for, from any of the community partners. 
Uh, so I, I mean, you know, all, all of us in this in this in this uh, world here were just sort of floored that they would proceed like that, um, because we've always always had the position, you know, people walking or playing in the street is a significantly less liability than a car driving through the street. So right. there had, you know, that, that that that's something that's been a problem for decades in this city. I know. Um, I feel like we need to have a whole other session just on liability and tort claims. But, but they have it, like I mentioned, 34th Street, uh, 34th Avenue and Jackson Heights, which you all should go take a look at. And it's remarkable. And, and that is, you know, completely low tech, uh, very diverse neighborhood. They have about, they have a good dozen, you know, local activists managing the streets. They have a schedule set up for moving the barriers, moving them out, free Zumba classes. You know, they've got sort of everything going on. Um, and have have not been stopped by the liability issues. So it's going to be really interesting to watch that and see what, how, what kind of prototype that becomes for us going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and then another new thing, you know, here is our restaurant streets. So then the maintenance becomes the responsibility. You know, we're privatizing the public space, but we're opening them up for people but then we have access to the restaurants to supplement the cleanup. So this is very new in New York. You know, it's just been expanded now that these, we can have restaurants, you know, the outdoor space is 365 and they can now heat that space. And we have something like 10,000 restaurants with outdoor space taking, you know, 0.8% of our curb space. Uh, but, you know, so it will be interesting to see, um, it's been very, like, will there be more liability issues? Because the application process has been very easy. Will the maintenance be put onto these private operators? You know, wh right. what kind of model will that afford? So how should we be thinking about who takes responsibility for these shared spaces? I mean, it's, it's something that hasn't been solved yet and we're living it. So, um, for those of for all of you who are experimenting with these different types of shared spaces and governance models, um, you know how do we think about this going forward? The city could assume liability for the public space. Yeah, right. and self do you make a deal and say, "I'll uh, you know you accept the liability and we'll maintain it"? So they could. Well, with, with us, uh, I think that's, that's the reason why um, a very collaborative process has been working so far in that we, we've, been, we've come to a place where we understand community needs a little bit more than just like going in and implementing projects. Because now we know that with, uh, with that comes all those responsibilities, which is why, like I said earlier, we're working on ensuring that we take on liability for projects such as the ones for the Great Streets Initiative. Right. Uh, because ultimately, they are in the public realm, you know, and I saw one of the comments, I think from Andy, in the, he says, we are the biggest entity involved and we pretty much, the city owns those spaces. So we need to start getting creative on how we take on this and just do a lot of work in the background to ensure that the engineering that goes into planning these improvements is one ADA accessible. We check all the boxes that are needed to, in order to ensure that, you know, that helps us even just minimize uh, the liability aspect of it. Right. And, so and let's, also, let's turn to how can cities ensure equitable access to open to outdoor spaces? And I think we began with Municipal Art Society looking at um, Fight for Light and, and Sunlight for underserved areas without adequate open space, especially in the coming winter months. And Wajenda, you may not have that kind of brutal weather that we have on the East Coast, but um, yeah, how do we ensure equitable access to these outdoor spaces? Jennifer, you wanna field that one? Um, I think that the, uh, that the, that the, community perspective is really has to be the driver on what that means. Um, you know, that for each of our 18 districts that we worked on this project, that was the first question is, what do you want to see in your street? 
Um, and the, the answers to that question are as diverse as the places that we asked it to. You know, some places really wanted um, a way to uh, gather together for impromptu performances. Some places wanted a play way to uh, have outside dining. Some places just wanted health and security signage. Uh, some places really wanted um, a way to um, begin to reopen their market to the street. Um, so, you know, I think that the, that the way each de neighborhood defined equitable access to the resource came from that neighborhood itself. Yeah. And some were really trying to um, make sure that the people were, that were using the spaces were protected and some really wanted to have that opportunity to try to support safe gathering but that that they knew their own pulse and could uh, could share that very openly um and i'm i'm really looking forward over the months to come um doing a lot of uh impact assessment like going back out there and having the conversations and saying you know how how has this affected your use of this space do you feel safer do you feel less safe um why what are you doing now that you never did before? Um, do you want to keep being able to do that and really learning from these opportunities um, to continue to have the people that use the space drive what equity means to them? Yeah, that's great to have that learning cycle of, mm -hmm. of building it and then really what were your takeaways and then building on that. Um, but I think specific to the neighborhood, that's really, um, that's really key. Mm -hmm. So, Another question is, what are some of the other, what are some of the needs for management at the local level versus the city level? Um, this is, I think, specific to New York, but do you think a director of the public realm or office of the public realm, I think this applies to all cities, would be helpful in addressing these cross-agency issues? I mean, I, I certainly do, you know, we, because uh, I don't know how it, works in, in Baltimore, or LA, but New York City, you know, our sidewalk has seven or eight different agencies that cover it, you know, and there are, there are other uh, cities that already have. <laughs> yeah, they're know. all nodding. Their they're heads. Not. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. yeah, you have yeah. offices of public works. So where they actually perceive these is one. Uh, so, and there are, there are, they do have memorandums of understanding and, you know, various agencies work with each other, but, you know, I think it's critical to have something under the mayor with the power to insist that people work across agencies. And then I'd love to see something in New York City, like, gen, you know, uh, DOT is trying, you know, and they have street seats and, you know, various things, um, but there's really not a comprehensive set of tools that have been developed for local neighborhoods that they can easily tap into. Right. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, think, I think we all, I don't, I don't know. So New York, it's, 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 it's really impossible. Is it easier in LA or Baltimore? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not easy. So the biggest, uh, so one of the things that the city is working on is to create you know, a, a position similar to that, but looking at more from the standpoint of infrastructure delivery through the mayor's office and building on some of the examples on how, because in order to implement great streets, you need to be able to co coordinate with every department. So building on the model on how we used to work with great streets and how we brought different uh, projects together and uh, different departments together to implement projects is how we're looking at how do we create this position whether it's just a position that we are looking, they were looking at two different aspects. One, creating maybe a platform where everything is filtered into one place and then distributing it, or having a position that is able to manage, you know, different, overseeing the different uh, departments so that we can have like one place where all these things are, are directed. But as, as of now, and as uh, like right now, as I'm speaking, we don't have any mechanism that's able to uh, guide those or just provide guidance on the public realm as a single entity. Just your winning personality, Wajenda. Right? <laughs> <laughs> cajoling your, cajoling your um, colleagues along. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so one of the things that, you know, as we think about resilience, social resilience, and, and also recovery. How do we, you know, how do we think about our open spaces 
as rebuilding this infrastructure um, that we're all that we're all being challenged um, to do now. So you know, I don't want to lose I don't want to lose track of um, actually living as a coastal city uh, where you know what what are we looking at rebuilding in terms of our infrastructure and our social resilience and our physical resilience. So I'll, I'll take I'll take a stab at that. Um, so one of the things that we've been looking at, especially with the popularity of of great of great streets, and then slow streets, then LA Alfresco, is just the demand for public infrastructure, which allows recreation and just understanding the benefits that come with that. We have we have a very our, the city of Los Angeles, if you look at it on a map, is very dispersed. It's very long, and we, we, we kind of go into different geographical regions based on where you are. But one of the things that has brought us together is just the idea of like going back to the community, even the way we implemented the uh, slow streets and the LR Fresco, we said we have a program, whoever is interested, come, come in. With them coming in, even through great streets, we are able to understand some of the you know basic needs they have. So we've been able to think about things like uh, we have urban heat islands. I know you are fighting for light over here. We have too much sunlight <laughs> that you know is affecting you know global warming and just affecting the quality of life for uh, Angelinos on a daily basis. So residents have been able to come up working with uh, uh, environmental groups to be able to, uh, to decide some, some of the basic infrastructure that's needed from planting more, more trees, um, which we have a great project on through the uh, cap and trade money. And then we are also looking at things like bioswale in order to, um, to avoid stormwater runoff. So we are, we are building various in infrastructure through different departments. And we are also incorporating some of those within the project, within projects like Great Streets or the zero emission areas that is planned to be, um, uh, to be implemented in, a, in the coming years. Yeah, I'm afraid there's not gonna be money for a lot of the infrastructure that we would need, you know, climate change infrastructure means, you know, really digging up the street, planting more gardens, thinking about biodiversity, doing all sorts of really exciting things to our, our streets. And, uh, you know, I, I just don't think there'll be the money for that, you know, for New York City for a good five to 10 years. I mean, I, uh, right, indeed. Yeah. And I wish I, I wish I was some, um, yeah. you know, could bring in some entrepreneurs. But we will talk to small businesses next week yeah. or in the next couple weeks um, and see what see what their ideas are on this on sustainability. So um, I believe that we're coming up to our time, but I wanted to ask, you know, um, many the media before we before we hand it off to Elizabeth. Um, you know, the many folks in media say the future of, this, of cities is dead. And um, you've all shown how adaptable and creative cities can be and way, in ways that we never thought were possible. So um, I'd invite you all to have one last word for us and policymakers um, on how to, how to create um, really vibrant and livable cities through open space for people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've seen the um, people of Baltimore stand up for the things that they treasure during this time. And many of them are taking place in open space. And we uh, continue to um, uh, uplift uh, uh, the, the social structure that uh, only takes place in the urban environment as I think one of the um, healthiest for human uh, interactions, as well as for the creativity that we all um, uh, believe, I think is at the source of the future solutions. That's all urban in my mind. And it's not, it might, we might be having a moment of fear and it is scary, um, but that's not gonna change the broad trajectory. I don't believe. Yeah, I mean, uh, our restaurant program, which there wasn't time and 
our open streets program has sort of morphed and now we have the restaurants and we have restaurant streets are sort of closed to traffic for longer periods of time over, you know, 24 hour periods. I mean, that's, that's what's sustaining the city because that, like right now for New York City, those are the bright spots. If you go out, you know, to Dykeman or Vanderbilt or Broadway or, you know, any of like one, they're everywhere. You know, they're in, they're in every borough. And uh, so the city, because, you know, New York City is all about the street and street life. I mean, we're, we're an outlier in that in this country. Um, it, it's not dead. And I think people are, um, you know, we've had, we, have this, we have this whole new paradigm now, which is very exciting. So I, I think that's something to look forward to. So people aren't going to be ready to give it up. <laughs> No, absolutely, absolutely not. I believe, you know, like we've seen in the city of Los Angeles that we've been, the city has been very resilient uh, through this. And one of the ways that I've seen this is one, communities taking up the charge to be, you know, leaders in their communities in terms of planning and what kind of infrastructure comes in. Uh, we've seen a lot of development still going on. If you, even if you go on a plum, uh, planning committee uh, Zoom call right now, you see there's still a lot of activity. So I think the city is very far from being dead. And what's encouraging is just how communities are realizing that they are part of the process and you know, taking up the charge to be able to be co-planners with the city to, to implement various projects. And speaking from the city standpoint too is we've seen this unprecedented you know pandemic hit us at a time that we least expected but we've been very nimble at responding to what the city needs so whether it's implementing the outside dining program or implementing slow streets we've been able to marshal resources to ensure that we are able to create a sustainable city in a way that is in a way that is very resilient and uplifting communities uh, in general. So I think we're still intact. The city is still here to stay. And I think we are, we're moving in a direction where we're becoming partners with communities to move the city forward. Well, on that note, thank you all. Um, and I would like to, and this has been a pleasure to hear your insights. Now I want to invite Elizabeth back to close our program. Well, I can't thank you all enough. This has been a really inspirational and interesting discussion. Um, uh, at MAS, we spend lots of time thinking about these issues, but I think that we um, were really moved to hear some of the ideas and inspiration that you all provided. Um, I, I do think that New York City is challenged at the moment from a financial perspective, but I also think uh, that many of the things that you all have uh, mentioned, the the uh, facility in the community, the willingness to try stuff, um, uh, all of those things are going to see us through um, while the money may be taking some time to follow. But I also think it's important to remember that these kinds of improvements in the street don't actually cost a ton of money compared to much other social infrastructure. So there are ways to begin to implement um, uh, perhaps on a smaller scale and, and begin to build to a more comprehensive program as hopefully the resources in New York City and in cities across the United States begin to, um, to return. But um, I have the honor and the pleasure of living on 34th Avenue and um, can, can uh, um, absolutely affirm Janet's uh, explanations of the marvel that it has been in our household. We call it the Champs-Élysées of Jackson Heights. Um, and uh, the, the experimentation has been quite extraordinary. And I think we, we all owe it to ourselves to learn from the experiments that are happening in LA and Baltimore and New York um, and in all the other cities where we're, we're, we're trying stuff in this moment of enormous pressure. So thank you all again. I, I couldn't, uh, we couldn't have had a better group of people to talk about this and to kick it off. And thank you to Susan for moderating this and the coming, uh, and the coming um, parts of our series. Um, she has also been really helpful in actually shaping the series, as, as you will see as we go on. Um, I'd also like to thank my colleagues in MAS, Tara and Iana and Jackie, 
who are brilliant at uh, conceiving and executing on these uh, and these incredible programs. Um, so I also hope that for those of you who have joined us this evening who are not members of MAS, that you will consider joining us. Uh, your membership dollars help us continue to provide this programming and uh, support our ongoing policy and advocacy work. Um, our next session in this series will focus on small business, as Susan uh, indicated, and will take place on October the 15th. Uh, registration will open sometime next week. So I hope you will join us again, um, whether you're in the audience or a speaker, and um, we hope that you all have a wonderful evening and hope to see you again next time. Thank you. <laughs>